believe it, but here we are, James and Kay, back on the Magnificent Seven. Hello, everybody. We have the delightful Neville Greenwood with us here, and his partner, Zell. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Okay. Hi, James. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> It's been an interesting wait, hasn't it? You've been here for like 35 minutes going, would you people get yourselves together? And here we are. I, I've just been looking at the just the amazing professionalism in the background. <laughs> <laughs> A well-oiled machine. I just cannot believe it. That's it. Exactly. Do we have to pay you for that? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm usually the one that's choosing the uh, the song themes, but uh, this one's a little bit different, and we have song selections, uh, lovely selections by Neville, um, some mildly dodgy selections by James, and you can Boys. pick and choose <laughs> as you go through how we go. So um, a huge uh, thank you to Dave Kay, who provided us with some fabulous music for the last couple of hours. It's been delightful with some cold play there at the end, which was uh, pretty good and good for us to switch studios with. Um, if you want to text us tonight, you can on 0485 838 436. We'll give that to you again later on. And uh, let's go to our first song, James, if you would be so kind, uh, with Disturbed, The Sound of Silence. Excellent choice. Well done, Neville. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, well, look, uh, having Simon and Garfunkel done by a heavy metal band and that raspy, rough resonance, you know, of the guy, just... It's, it's, I love how people take stuff and just make it their own. Yeah. Well, that's something you were talking about Zell doing earlier, weren't you? Uh, this is completely off script. Well, has Zell um, got a raspy, rough voice? <laughs> <laughs> that's very nice, usually. Hey, you told me you wouldn't tell. <laughs> you? Taking, do you want to just um, briefly mention the the um, opera and how it was taken slightly off script? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Put you on the spot briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, Ilanta or Ilanta is the last opera that Tchaikovsky ever wrote and it's received very little attention. <laughs> but... I think that's because people just don't know how to treat it, what to do with it. But the story of Ilanta is really about a princess who is born blind and his father, the king, hides her away in a mansion in the middle of some forest somewhere. Well, it's in France. And um, and she's brought up with uh, by her maids and he comes to see her occasionally and he's banned anyone around her to talk about sight. He doesn't want her to know that she can't see and uh, so they're not allowed to talk about sight. They're not allowed to tell her anything about anything being beautiful or anything sight related. And so the the story really, the original story is uh, from the father's and other people's point of view of Iolanta. And that was how you made the adjustment, wasn't it? It was that point of view from yes. the father's perspective that you yes. changed in the writing? Yes, yes. So we uh, rewrote the narrative. So the challenge when you're doing an opera, uh, updating an opera, is really you can't change the music. Mm. And we had a bigger challenge in that <laughs> it's actually written in Russian. Oh, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had to put it to English, and so that in its and you you had to make sure whatever you did uh, really tried to fit into the music, and uh, so then we had uh, we we had to keep the story as it is, uh, but we changed the narrative not through the music but by having a narrator in the form of an older Iolanta talking, uh, telling her story when the incident of the opera happened. Mm. Can I um, ask you, um, is Iolanta the story a an original script or is something that um, a, um, Tchaikovsky uh, knocked up in his back room or how did that come about? Well, my understanding is that it was something that Tchaikovsky came up with Possibly based on a real king who may have had a, a daughter who's blind. Mm, okay. But I'm not sure of the background. Uh, but the the story Neville was saying before, it's very paternalistic because everyone was deciding what was the best for Iolanta. Uh, but when Iolanta's telling the story, uh, she makes the decision on how her life's going to proceed. That is a that is a change from the original script. So yes. obviously writing is in the family because Neville, you're <laughs> you're a poet, um, songwriter, and well, yeah. look, I like the sound of that. It's not what I do every day, <laughs> uh, but yes, you know, just keep it coming. You know, I like that. Uh, so how how did you get into it? What was the catalyst for you getting into writing? Look, it was sort of a sad beginning because uh, my nephew died tragically in a, in a skiing accident um, and I had to go back for the funeral to Sydney where, where I grew up. I've been here 31 years so don't hate on me. All right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went back for the funeral and the way the funeral was was exactly how it was when I was eight when my dad had died. So like the fake carpet you know the fake grass the, the, the you know the, the sort of the, the ring around the the uh, you know, the, the grave, the, frames the, ho- the whole thing, everything, like, you know, the, the pile of dirt, the shovel in it, the whole thing, everything was like exactly. So I felt like I'd sort of gone back 40 years in time and it sort of confronted me and up until then I hadn't, I had pretty much kept it to myself. It's sort of that when he died at that time, it was in the 70s, so um, it wasn't, you know, like 
it wasn't talked about. We didn't talk about it. So I pretty much had 40 years. I didn't talk about my dad's death. And then I sort of was confronted to go back and see it. And, and it sort of just opened me up, I suppose, and emotionally to, uh, to start writing. And, and I, I came back and, you know, I started writing from then on. And you haven't just written one poem and one song. Uh, yeah, well, I've got, I've got 40, about 40 poems. And wow. I think I had about... I think I've got about 96 lyrics that I've written for songs. <laughs> so, which is the bizarre thing because, I, you know, I can't even find C on an instrument. But I've got 96 songs out there. Um, <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> which is a bit crazy. <laughs> now, the next song, uh, you're actually not particularly impressed with the uh, version that I chose. Do you want to tell us about that? This well, is Kay, uh, Leonard I, Cohen, Let It Be Your Will. Well, Kay, look, I don't want to diss on you <laughs> here. but um, Feel free. Look, the, the version of this that I absolutely love is the Web Sisters and they have a harp playing because Leonard Cohen can't sing to save his life, but he's a great songwriter. Okay, well, let's uh, listen to Leonard Cohen, Let It Be Your Will, um, not the Supreme version, the other version. <laughs> Sorry, Leonard. Any second. <laughs> If it be your will that I speak no more, and my voice be still as it was before.
FM 107.3, the voice of your community. Does your business have a good web presence? Are you missing business opportunities by having an outdated web page? Did you know there are six important tips to boost your web personality? Let station sponsor Antonovich Design build or update your web page. Your website will be custom designed to suit your needs working directly with our experienced designers. Get more leads and more conversions with a web page that is browser friendly and works on all devices. Call Antonovich Design on 0449 134 191.
voice of your community. 107.3 HFM in Gosnells, Armadale, Cannington and Serpentine, Gerardale. We're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. Those of you who uh, successfully picked up that that was not at all Leonard Cohen, <laughs> it was of course Anthony. Um, so thank you everyone who wanted to mention that. And there was a reason for that song, was there, Neville? Um, yeah, well, it, it's about rebirth, I suppose, because uh, he wrote that song. He'd been in a monastery, if you believe, for seven years. He'd hey. gone away for seven years. He pretty much wound his career down. He came back. His manager had stolen all his money, so he had to start again. So it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek song to say, sort of was like a prayer to God, you know, if you really want me to sing, you know. <laughs> if it be your will. Then I will. I like it. Let's see, it's, it's fun knowing those stories. Um, talking about stories, I know that your dad has been an influence on your writing, and there's a story about him in the Navy, isn't there? Let's, yeah. Tell us about that. Look, my dad uh, was in the Merchant Navy, which is the worst one to be in because you didn't have any guns to defend yourself. And, and in the beginning of the war, the U-boats were basically blowing them out of the water. So he joined up uh, young, like underage, and uh, his first ship out was going to Murmansk because at that stage they were basically taking provisions to Russia so they could fight Germany. Um, and uh, first ship out, he gets it gets sunk. He's in a convoy. Bang. And, uh, yeah, it gets sunk. And uh, basically uh, the the rest of the people in the convoy had said, OK, that ship's gone, there's no, no survivors. Uh, and a few hours later, another ship had come by in that same area, uh, found him swimming in the water, pulled him aboard. Um, the convoy had already sent message back that, you know, everyone was lost. So my grandmother and grandfather got a, a basic telegram saying... Um, your son's dead, you know, too bad. Sort of, wow. well, not too bad, but, you know, basically yeah. um, everyone's lost. And because of radio silence, they, they didn't find out for a few days that he was actually alive. So for two days, they thought he was dead. Um, and, and that was the first of three ships that he was sunk on. First of, first of three? Three. He was a survivor of one. He was the only survivor on that one. He, I think he was one of three and one of five. Because these uh, merchant ships were just being blown out of the water by the U-boats because they d- hadn't didn't have an effective countermeasure to it at the, at the time. Gosh. Okay, um, so the we've got a, a song coming up that's actually one of yours um, called River of Tears. River of Tears. Um, yeah, and look, um, my grandfather was also uh, involved in the war and his he used to go around after the air raids and literally people would be blown up every day. You'd have to get all the parts and put them away and it was a terrible job. And my uncle had gone um, gone with him. He used to have to climb up trees and do all sorts of horrible things to get arms and legs and heads and all the rest of it. And uh, so I suppose there's that sort of impact of the just senselessness of war, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and 100th anniversary, there was in Willerton, there was a... or Riverton, there was a, a commission play... Uh, or, or a musical that was put on and uh, it really brought home to me just the futility of war. So that's how River of Tears really came about. It came about on the 100th anniversary of the Anzac um, Anzac Day. So, yeah. Fantastic. So this is an original uh, called River of Tears by Neville Greenwood. There's a river of tears that's washed through our lands Mothers losing their sons And wives losing their men Children losing their father History repeating again Too quick to walk was without end There's a river of tears that's washed through our lands April 25 has come around again Stories of glory 11,000 Anzacs were dead Trenches of bodies thickened with flies Maimed and dismembered Repeating 
wash through our lands A hundred years is gone in a blink The reasons are clear If you just stop and think In a hundred years We can stem the Kiwis, Aussies, French, our reasons conjoined But the outcome was wrenched 130,000 dead in a trench Sean Thetter Kate from Adelaide. Yeah. Uh, he uh, did the uh, the uh, singing and the music on that one. So awesome. great job! You did a great job. Yes, as did you. The the we we were talking over the lyrics, but I have listened to them before and they're quite moving. Yes, um, and your poetry is also quite moving. Um, you have one here called "Everyone Knew You But Me," which I think is along a similar theme about your dad. Is that right? Yeah, because um, one of the things happened. I. In that time, the thinking was, don't tell the children that someone's dying because you don't want to upset them. That was sort of the, the rather paternalistic sort of yeah. way that was and, it was. and you pretty much went to the doctor for advice. So the doctor was being the counsellor and the doctor at the same time. They said, oh, don't tell the kids, it'll upset them, all that sort How of thing. How far back are we going? 70s. Right, yeah, okay. So, um, you know, so basically... I was under the impression my dad was getting better. It was just going to take some time. So, but really, he was in palliative care and mm. he had stomach cancer. Mm. Um, so when he died, it, it was a, quite a shock. I was just, you know, playing soccer training, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and they said, oh, you got to come home. And I go, why, why? And they go, look, I can't tell you, you just got to come home. So I came home and it was, a, it was the most bizarre day in my life because I came home and my house was full of people drinking and eating. So I just, it was sort of, obviously they were there to sort of, you know, mm. help my mum, but I hadn't heard the news yet. So I sort of walked into this house, people drinking and eating, and my mum tells me, you know, like, oh, your dad's dead. And I, so it was quite a shock. And so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, why are we all partying here? This isn't, you know, this isn't right. So, and 
I had a real sense of betrayal. It was like everyone knew what was going on around me mm. and they didn't tell me. So I thought, I started feeling guilty about, you know, the custard pudding I had when I'd go up and see him in the hospital, you know, you know, and all sorts of weird sort of thoughts and I felt really betrayed. So it sort of made me quite distanced from pretty much everyone around me for quite a while because I just felt like I couldn't trust anyone. That's really interesting. So, so, yeah, that's so a really anyway, interesting perspective. So, yeah, that's what the poem comes out. So I will read the poem, sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> I didn't and, forget. <laughs> and you were only eight. I was only eight. So you just don't have the cognitive skills at that, you know, to really understand, you know, you know the, whole, the context of it. There's a, there's a scene in um, The Sixth Sense, the movie, the one with Bruce Willis, where, you mm. know, the little boy walks through the, the crowd of people with the whatever it is, the little chest, and I, that's the vision I've got of, of you kind of walking in and, and not knowing what's going on. It's quite powerful. Yeah. Anyway, so, poetry. So it's called uh, Everyone Knew You But Me. Um, Everyone knew you but me, living my life eight and carefree, playing soccer and kicking the ball. That day stopped, I threw up a wall. Come home, I can't explain, there is no need to train, a room full of strangers drinking and eating without an explainer. I never knew you were about to die. No one told me, they all lied. I can't go back to have the last days, the last months to leave a trace. I don't know after all these years I sit down sobbing in tears. Forty years on I take on this tone. It used to make me feel so alone. For after your death there was nothing, no explanation, just to be tougher. Block out your thoughts and feelings, lonely and unaware, it left me reeling. It was as if you didn't exist, just flickering memories persist. Crazy instances of no import, ludicrous memories of a child to sort. My memories of you reduced to scraps and pics, letters, Super 8 and other bits. It's too late to find you or hear it. I can't even feel you in spirit. I feel spirit in others who have passed. Why can't I feel you at last? I tried for so long for you to reach out to me. I never understood why did you flee. I guess it's too late to turn back time. My efforts and attempts reduced to a rhyme. I finished my grieving, it's never to be, because everyone knew you but me. Beautiful, Neville. Thank you. This is Ed Sheeran, Perfect Symphony, featuring Andrea Bocelli.
tuned to The Magnificent Seven on HFM 107.3. Your first choice in great music and great interviews. Next time your internet buffers, lags or drops out, I want you to say it with me, Perth. We deserve better internet. Get your internet flying through the air quick as a flash. Pentanet is Perth's own private internet network, delivering super-fast fixed wireless internet in selected coverage areas. With $0 standard install for a 12-month home or business fixed wireless plan, join Pentanet and make the switch to fast, reliable, local internet. Search Pentanet now. Station sponsor.
Adam from Peking Duck here for Rad. We see a lot of our fans do a lot of crazy things at our shows, but it's always in the name of fun. You can enjoy yourself in any way that you like, but if you have a few drinks at a gig, then you're crazy if you think you can drive home. If you want to party, just keep it simple. Plan ahead and share a taxi. Catch public transport or have a designated driver who won't drink a drop. But whatever you do, don't make the next gig your last. A message for Rad. In Armadale, Gosnells, Cannington and Serpentine Jarradale. We're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. You're making frantic motions to James thinking this is a CSA that we're going into a community service announcement and he's absolutely right it's not and I should have known better sorry about that <laughs> and you can just sit there and appreciate the fact that you were right and you were wrong yes I might remind you of that <laughs> I don't doubt it <laughs> Um, we were talking about uh, tech, actually, uh, Neville, because I know that you're involved in tech, and one of the things that you've done in your book is you've included QR codes. James is a big fan of QR codes. Why, why the QR code? What led you to doing that? Look, it, it just makes it easier for people, uh, basically, in the bottom left-hand corner, you're going to be able to just scan your camera over it, and it will basically have me reading the poem to you. So, basically, you can go through the whole book, um, and if you've got difficulties with reading, uh, but you know you, you obviously can hear, then you know it makes it easier for you to be able to get through the book. Of course, you can get a, get the audio book, which will come out. But mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, it sort of gave people accessibility, in, you know, on the first run without them having to go to a second tier, uh, you know, uh, media. I don't suppose that would have anything to do with Zell's influence. <laughs> oh, it might have done. <laughs> it might have done. Uh, yeah, it's been quite interesting being with Zell um, because up until I met Zell, I hadn't actually talked to a blind person at all. So is that right or do I have to say BVI? What's the... Am I uh, it's okay. speaking out of turn? No. But because Zell was blind f- from birth and um, you don't understand when you're visually... Like you, know, like you go, when, go you're sighted. when you're sighted and you go through the world in a completely visual uh, sense, um, that, you know, all the problems, you know, like just going to the cupboard and getting, you know, a tin of, you know, peaches or mushrooms or whatever. And, of course, I'm the biggest culprit for mixing them up. So poor old Zell goes to, you know... Grab the Vegemite. Yes. Finds out she's got marmalade instead. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, the Vegemite jars are pretty distinct, <coughs> thankfully. But yeah. when you've got a can of tomatoes and a can of something else, beans, for example, yeah. Yeah, there's no way without tech that you can tell what's what or without someone with eyes around that you can ask. I'd never even considered that. How, how do you deal with that? <laughs> there's different ways you can deal with it. Of course, my preferred way, the easiest way is, you know, if someone else is Neville, around. What's yeah. this? <laughs> exactly. Where the hell are the mushrooms? Yeah. I put them here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but there's a lot of tech as well now. Apps on our phones, uh, seeing AI, other form of apps, um, QR readers, so they can, we can use Use them now to actually distinguish See, what's QR what. QR codes. I keep saying they're a great yeah. answer uh, and a great solution yeah. to almost anything. Well, they are. I, I I would totally agree with you there. And we've got the house wide up. It, it's basically got Google. Uh, what's it Google called? Everything. Google Home. Yeah. Google Home. Yeah. So we just basically well, Google go, Mini. Hey Google, turn on the lounge lights, or Hey Google, open the garage, or you know whatever. Mm-hmm. Hey, Google, get the can of tomatoes out the fridge. I wish. (laughs) Oh, she wishes. We're not there yet. Uh, But the reason why I got the Google uh, Mini really is because um, the lights I have in my living area are, what are they, combined? They're dual. Dual lights, So basically if you're in the hallway, you can turn the light down and you can be in the kitchen and turn it up. So you don't know whether the light's on or off. Um, so traditionally, you'd have interrupt you, Zell. Um, mm. How si- are you sighted at all, or is there just um, no? Um, I can see light perception? and dark, and that's it. Okay. Yep. Which right. doesn't get me far. Mm-hmm. But you know, my cicada rhythm sometimes works because of it. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah, I can sleep. <laughs> but well, the question: Why would you care if the lights were on or off? That's oh, just yeah. for everybody it's else. Cost well, electricity, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, because sometimes you come home and all the lights would be on. Like you used to have cleaners come in mm. and they'd leave all the lights on, 
and if you didn't know the setting, you wouldn't know whether it was on or off. Mm. So if if there was only one light and one up and down, that's fine. But when you've got multiple, you can end up with the, the house being lit all day, you're not even there. Yeah, so traditionally, you know, you the light switch is down, the lights are on, yeah. the light switch is up, the lights are off. But because of the dual system, that system doesn't work. The light switch can be up or down and the light can be on or off, so I have no idea what's going on. Especially during the daytime when you've got daylight and sunlight conflicting and then I really can't tell which light is what. So the light could be on all day and I'd have no idea. And, of course, if I'm in the doghouse, she goes, hey, Google, open garage door. You know, it's <laughs> like, how'd you go, fella? <laughs> oh. Yeah, that, that one was a bit of a bonus, the Google one. <laughs> um, now, I deliberately uh, put the next song after this because this is um, this is for you and I, Zell. This is Aretha Franklin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is great. I love this Yes, song. me too. This is uh, A Natural Woman, uh, and this is with the uh, Royal Phil. This is a great version of the song too. It is, and I also love Aretha Franklin. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Um, we're actually going to talk about AI art because you've used AI art in your book. Yes. Um, well, look, I, I can't draw. Look, people look at my stick man and go, really? Really? Why did you bother? So my, my uh, skills at drawing are very bad. So uh, to be able to use AI to basically encompass what's in the uh, poem is... You know, it's basically adding to me, giving... It's a skill I don't have. It's a huge advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? So, you, you know, uh, you can't see them here, but we've got a few examples in the, uh, in the, in the room here. We have indeed, yes. One, one looks like a little bit like a man with an onion head. He was like a peeling onion. What's the poem that goes with that? Yeah, peeling the onion. So, right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was so, on the money. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Just for the sake of our listeners uh, who may not be so clear, it is artificial intelligence. So, um, so Neville, perhaps you could um, explain um, again to our listeners uh, why and how is AI used to create images and what's the process, if you can just keep it fairly brief. Uh, look, I mean, you can create images that you probably wouldn't be able to create through photographs and certainly you would need a very uh, amazing graphic artist to be able to create some of these images. So, and, and you know, you can do it in literally... 15, 20 seconds. Um, you used Dali to do it, have you? Uh, I used uh, Leonardo, actually. Okay. Yeah, because they allow you to do it without the copyright problems. <laughs> so the artificial intelligence effectively has gone out to the internet. It's found lots of things. It's pieced it together to meet the criteria that you've given it. Yeah. So you're the artist in that you've created the piece of work because you've told it what to provide. Yes, you, you have to have clear prompts. A prompt is basically a description of what you're after. So it, it's like anything else, garbage in, garbage out. If you, you give it bad prompts, you're going to get a bad image. So you, you have to really think about clearly what you want. So there's a little bit of learning in that, but, you know, not a lot, but at least you have to really be clear about what you're telling it because it will do what you ask for. So if you don't give it clarity, you get rubbish. And it's quite interesting because the bit that I've dabbled with it, you know, you could ask it for a frog. You know, it's not until you actually ask Dali to give you pictures of a frog that you realise how many, you know, how many frogs aren't what you're expecting. <laughs> they're the wrong colour, they're the wrong size, they're, com uh, you know, comedic rather than, than real, or they're in a pond, they're with a princess, you know, it's, you do have to be very, very specific. I'm just going to agree with you because there's, there's lots of frogs out there. <laughs> 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 were you something, expecting something insightful and clever there, were you? I was. I, I was expecting you to argue with the whole AI art thing completely, actually. Uh, not, not right at this moment. <laughs> Is that a dating reference? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> so we have Billy Joel coming up next <laughs> with a Lullaby Goodnight My Angel. Uh, not a song I'm personally familiar with, but a lovely one. It is a beautiful song. He wrote it for his daughter. Uh, they were breaking up. Um, I think I can't remember the model name he was married to, but uh, they were breaking up and Christy Brinkley. Christy Brinkley. Yeah, Good and night, uh, yeah, so he basically wrote this for his daughter. So look, no matter where I am, you know, you're, I'm always part of you. So and yeah, save beautiful these questions for another day. I think I know what you've been asking me I think you know what I've been trying to say I promised I would never leave you And you should always know Never will be far away. Good night, my angel. Now it's time to sleep. And still, so many things I want to say. Remember all the songs you sang for me when we went sailing on an emerald bay.
night, my angel, now it's time to dream And dream how wonderful your life will be Someday your child may cry And if you sing this lullaby Then in your heart there will always be a part of me Someday we'll all be gone, but lullabies go on and on. They never die, that's how you and I will be. We hope you're enjoying your evening. Here with the Magnificent Seven on HFM 107.3. Looking for your local coffee haven? Then look no further than station sponsor That Plant Cafe in Kelmscott, right opposite Dan Murphy's on the Albany Highway. Sip on a delicious brew and savour healthy, hearty breakfast options. Oh, God, it's so good. Explore a selection of local goodies and glorious plants. They're open for breakfast from 6am, so swing by and say hello before they close at 4. That Plant Cafe, your perfect morning, midday or afternoon retreat, where great coffee and lush greenery meet. Station sponsor.
like your music, hard and heavy or punchy and melodic? How about music with a real attitude? If so, Rock Aria can lift your spirit, turn it on its head, roll it up in a ball and toss it in the air. Latest releases and classics from here and around the world. Interviews covering the local scene and special events. Even artists live in the studio. Two hours of the latest and greatest tune. Rock Aria, Saturdays from 3. Rock Aria, Rock and Roll Overload. In Thornley, Mount Nasura and Jarradale, we're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. Neville, like technology feels like it's changing so fast. I mean, you're using AI and QR codes in your book and you work in IT. So tell me, is there something, and like you too, Zell, what is it about technology of the future that terrifies you and what excites you? Well, AI excites me and terrifies me at the same time. Uh, right. Look, AI has the ability to make us all function at a much higher level because we can uh, we can essentially get the best brains of the world. Essentially, that's what AI is. It's the smartest person in the world at, at your beck and call, essentially. But the problem becomes if that gets misused, you can end up being controlled or being excluded from the world. You know? I don't know how you feel about it, Zell. I agree. And just the fact that mm, as technology develops, we have less and less privacy. There's more of our, all of our information out there in the ether. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of control issues or potential, potentially controlling. Privacy invasion, I think is what it's called. Yeah, privacy invasion as well as, you know, control. It, it will be much easier to control people, I think, uh, for governments and powers that be. Mm. But, uh, look at the, the, but, but then if I look at it, you know, that's the downside. On the upside, it's just made and making life so much easier and everything's at our fingertips and we don't really have to think about much. Well, uh, looking at it from a slightly... Um what would be the word? Humanistic? Uh, let, let's go with that. Um, <laughs> it, while, while I think the majority of the population of the world are essentially looking for um, a, a, a simple life, a positive life, a good life, it's only going to take one um, dictator um, to take these technologies and corrupt the, um, the positive values of them uh, to make, make it all... Um, what would we call it? I'm forgetting my Englanding. I'm counting. I'm not Englanding very well at the moment. <laughs> um, it, it, it's going to be destroy the. It's going to be destroying the value, the positive um, values uh, associated with AI. I think. Yeah, that's a bit like saying that a dictator could take over the internet. I mean, that's not very realistic, is it? Um, ask the Chinese. Ask the mm. Russians. Is it not really? I think it's pretty realistic. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, I was talking to a delightful friend of mine, uh, Sarah Lee, just recently, who um, does social media for a living. I was and cheesecakes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yes. Um, thinking. <laughs> and uh, she calls AI Reese because apparently, statistically, about only 15 or 20 percent of the content on AI is um, from women. Most of it, of course, historically has been from men, and that explains why it gets things wrong so often. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like sand beds, for example. <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> look, but look, I, I did have a guy who had an amazing use of it. He basically told the AI to set up a meeting with Albert Einstein and, you know, a whole lot of different people and said, right, we need your view. It actually came, had a really amazing outcome. I wish I could find that YouTube video because it, it really did work through a problem from a whole lot of different mindsets and came up with reasonably good solution. That's genius. That's genius. Yes. I've seen one recently on LinkedIn which is AI predicting the um, how different cities are going to look in the future in 50 years' time. That was amazing. Finland hadn't changed at all. Uh, <laughs> trees, green streets, people walking. But uh, some of the other cities were dramatically different. Mm. Uh, this morning I was, um, I've was i been having a problem with uh, my Adobe subscription and uh, I use um, Adobe for Photoshop, Lightroom, um, Premiere Pro, um, m most of the major software yeah. suites which, which are associated with Adobe. And I bought a plug-in this morning and the idea was to turn the... Um, the person I was working on uh, into a cartoon so I, I coughed up $30 and it of course was no longer compatible with my uh, oh, no. suite so 
you, you get onto the chat bot at the bottom corner and they wanted to cancel my subscription entirely and you, they, they wouldn't uh, understand the actual question I was putting to them. I tried calling uh, as well and uh, I got through to somewhere in India with uh, another bot but speaking Indian and uh, <laughs> so you can only imagine where that went uh, south and uh, I eventually ended up calling um, the, the Sydney office and uh, got a chap called Matt who has failed to deliver the goods either so I'm a little bit annoyed with AI and bots and clearly it isn't the, the panacea to all evils. Yeah, sometimes technology can leave you feeling quite powerless if you've got no means of feeding back to the people or if the means that they do provide aren't working. It really does make you feel quite powerless. But I must say, um, living as a blind woman in this day and age with loads of technology, I think I'm far better off than my predecessors in the past. Even if I'm to compare my life from when I was in my 20s where I was doing some, uh, I was doing paid work and everything back then, this is in the 90s, um, was all paper. Everything was on paper. You had the yellow pages, white pages, uh, every, encyclopedias were all paper and people had to look up this paper, you know, all the time, which of course excluded me in my workplace when people wanted someone to look up the yellow pages or the white pages for something it certainly wasn't going to be me was, was there ever a braille version of the white pages or various encyclopedias which you could refer to there might have been i've never seen them but look who's going to sit there and braille out the uh white pages in full which Costs. gets renewed every year yeah. it's yeah. a matter yeah. of time and cost time yeah, and money yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know it's not practical to do it uh, dictionary. I had the Oxford Dictionary from t God knows when it was. I can't remember now, but it was that one dictionary was in 16 big, thick volumes of Braille. Good oh, gracious. You know, so that's what I'm talking about. It used to be huge. So it was uh, a lot to carry around. And I, so consequently, I never had a dictionary with me, you know, when I was working and things like that. Whereas you look now and, you know, you've got this little phone that's got everything on it. It's the old story of a maths teacher saying, you know, you have to learn your times tables because you're not going to be carrying a calculator around yeah. with you. you well, know? yes, you are now. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. We all carry uh, calculators, <laughs> note takers, encyclopedia. Well, Google knows everything. Uh, various forms of Google as well. You know, this. We've got maps. We've got almanacs. We've got dictionaries, thesauruses, uh, encyclopedias. Everything that we can access on our phone, and it's and not only, you know. Can these phones be operated by sighted people, but also people like myself who have various disabilities? So I think for once, you know, I do feel included in many ways. Hmm. Although, you know, technology can also be exclusive if it's not done properly. But when it is done well, designed well, it's actually really, really uh, effective, I think, in, in uh, facilitating inclusion. That's fabulous. Um, I think it's time to um, harass you again, Neville. Uh, we, sure. you're, we're going to be playing one of your songs in a minute. Would you like to talk a little bit about it first? Well, you know, I... I look. So I, I dug into <laughs> Neville's songs and I chose this one and it's very, very different from the one we heard before because I was trying to show the breadth of the work that he does. But it's probably quite an old song that... You know, hasn't seen the light of day very much, or and perhaps not radio play so much. Well, look, it, it's 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 certainly an out there song. It's a very spiritual song, and, and, and to understand the seventh sight, so you got your five senses. So you got touch, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and then I consider the sixth sense is your ability to internet interact with spirit, but your seventh sense is your intuition. So this is sort of the seventh sight. So that's that's sort of how I, I sort of picked this song. I, and I did write it on a Virgin airplane because there was there was no TV. Um, you only got f fed once. So I had this sort of five-hour flight back from uh, Sydney to Perth. And like it was like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't watch anything. I couldn't listen to anything. So you know I was just 
totally in, in the zone on this one. And creating this. And, so this is, it. yeah, the seventh sight? Yes. By Seven, you? Yes. And you're Sounds singing like I'm it? Trippy. <laughs> Who, who's singing this one? Uh, I think Chris. I uh, can't remember his last name. Thanks, his last thanks name Chris. to Chris as well. Chris. Yeah, but uh, uh, original by Neville. Yeah, so yeah. Thanks.
going to take the tone down a little bit. Can you tell me about um, another one of your poems? This one I know was related to your nephew. So can you tell us a bit about um, the Huggy poem and how it came about and read the poem to us? Yeah, well, my uh, nephew unfortunately died at uh, 32. He had, a heart, he had had heart problems since he was young and six months old he had a stroke. A bit of his heart came off, went into his brain. He lost about 70% of his brain and because of brain plasticity it sort of grew back. But he had social issues and, um, you know, so he wasn't r- quite, you know, like f- fully functioning, but he was mostly there. Um, but he had the most beautiful soul absolute sunshine on on legs you know like his main thing he wanted everyone to be happy and he used to come up and give people these big hugs and you know, you know the size of me like he could lift me up he'd get, give me this big bear hug and he'd sort of lift me up um and look it was such a sad thing you know 32 you know but um you know, so, so this was the essence of him he sure did give good hugs so um you know i read this at his funeral and it was um you know Special for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I closed my eyes this morning, feeling sadness and feeling blue, when joyful images came to me of someone special that I knew. I couldn't quite believe it. We'd only talked that week. He was so full of living life, so many things we'd yet to speak. Memories invade my thoughts as he bounds up and down. Hugs, big hugs, he shouts as he lifts me off the ground. He had a sense of Hagrid with softness at its core, always a happy greeting whenever I walked on through the door. He had a heart of gold and he sure did give good hugs. He always had a loving smile, never an unkind word I heard. He ran up and down the house, which at times I thought absurd, but it was just him being him and playing with unfettered glee. I wish I could be so liberated. I wish I could find that joy in me. He loved to play with Connor. He gave his heart and soul. He loved to rock him in his horse. He embraced the uncle role. He took to life with no regrets. He really loved his art. His ice hockey was impassioned. He lived his life with heart. He had a heart of gold and he sure did give good hugs. I was struck by his kindness, his loving ways I'd see. He taught me pure joyfulness. He showed the way to be. Farewell, you beautiful soul. Your life too short for sure. I keep seeing your bright red beard and you walking through the door. I know I will reconnect one day in a place we all must go. I can see your open arms and a big bear hug I know. We'll miss his abundant goodness. We'll miss his bottomless well of love. He had a heart of gold and he sure did give good hugs. He had a heart of gold and he sure did give good hugs. That's beautiful. Do you have... uh, Do you have something you can read (laughs) us that can lift it up a little bit? All right, all right. Okay. I know that all of your stuff isn't uh, quite so deep. Yeah, look, I, I do have quite a lot of uh, poems that are not going to make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I wrote this one. I don't, I don't know whether many people know about the Henley on Todd regatta, but uh, um, it, it's, it's a boat race. It's in the middle of Alice Springs, uh, and it's only run when the river is dry. Well, that makes absolute perfect sense, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here's my poem about the Henley on Todd regatta. There's a certain type of crazy that's only found in Alice. It was modelled on a British race. It was not done out of malice. Now, Australians love to pull the British leg. So, Reg, he started out a rumour. He'd kick off a yacht regatta in the desert. A wicked sense of humour. So, old Reg Smith in 1962 turn, turned rumour into action. He started the Henley on Todd regatta and he really got some traction. Now let me set the scene for where this god-forsaken race is being run. It's in the Todd River, in the desert region, all sand and scorching sun. So you're probably wondering how can you hold a yacht race in a river that's only sand? All these boats are no ordinary boats. They have holes in the bottom and they are manned. The events, they have such English names like the kayak and rowing fours, but there's one event, an Aussie classic, with budgie smugglers galore. 
Now, budgie smugglers have got their name based upon a bird. It's the way the skimpy swimming trunks look. It's really quite absurd. It's hard to believe this regatta has been run every year since 1962, except for 1993 when some teams they had a blue. You see, the heavens opened up and the rivers ran strong that day. The organisers called it off, but some teams decided to compete and stay. It was by far the most controversy the race had seen in years. You'll all drown your bloody drongos, the race organisers cried. It will end in tears. The appeal they lodged was unsuccessful, even though the boats did stay. One of them got caught in a torrent and nearly washed away. Well, fast forward to today's race and the rowing four captains are ready with three others. Sally Smothers, Crafty Barry Bingle and Dashing Dan Carruthers. The crowd roared in anticipation as the starting gun was ready. Three, two, one, on your marks and teams, let's be steady. Bang! The gun went off. All teams rushing down the straight. No quarter was given in this great race. It was mate versus mate. Sally's team had been held back by some lads behind the field. Barry had done some cheating, it would come out on appeal. (laughs) But the gals struggled free and caught up to the blokes. Dashing Dan began to worry. He didn't want to choke. Dashing Dan and Barry Bingle urged their crews for more. They pushed and pulled poor Sally's team. It was certainly against the law. It was neck and neck for sure. All teams went round the final bend. The crowd was roaring as the race got closer, near the bitter end. The teams crossed the line for the final time and race history was made. The photo finish was called for. The teams collapsed amongst the shade. The judges rushed to huddle and consult upon the winner. It seemed it was a three-way tie. No margin could be thinner. But Sally lodged two appeals, for she felt that she'd been cheated. There was no way she would let them win. She wouldn't be defeated. Barry had held the girls back, and the boys looked a little scared. And Dashing Dan had pushed and pulled and cheated all he dared. So the judges, after much discussion, awarded Sally's team the winner in the matter. And so they won the rowing fours that year in the Henley Todd Regatta. <laughs> that's got a real Banjo Patterson feel to Absolutely. it, hasn't it? That's, <laughs> that's a cracker. Um, I, I remember in the when I was younger, let's put it that way, um, there was a uh, um, a poet who uh, um, delivered similar sorts of uh, um, work so slightly comical, but uh, with the same sort of um, um, timing as you've just you know, just given us. Yeah. I liked it though, very good. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Well, I'm glad we brought the mood up now. <laughs> well, and we're going to go back down a little bit again. So, uh, we're going to go into Miracle of Sound, uh, Valhalla Calling. This is from Assassin's Creed. And um, yes, I think you've mentioned to me that this was part of the funeral service for your nephew. Yes, well, they actually changed some of the wording. Instead of uh, Valhalla Calling, they, they uh, changed it to uh, Heaven Calling and changed a few other words in there. Um, my other nephew changed that. And they had like a chorus and, and so basically at the end of the uh, funeral everyone in the in the chapel was singing this said this is an enormous this is like a cathedral and
24-7, non-stop. HFM, the voice of your community. Second Chance Community Hub at Unit 1, 227 Railway Ave, Kelmscott is all about connecting the community. We specialise in costumes and retro goods and run various classes and workshops. So if you would like to share your skills and run a class or learn new skills, give Second Chance Community Hub a call on 6290 7068 or find Second Chance Community Hub on Facebook. Station sponsor. Cleaning up of litter and illegal dumping from our streets, parks and reserves costs the city of Armadale's rate pays hundreds of thousands of dollars each year now to help stop this illegal activity. Report any dumping of waste you see to Waste Services 9394-5000. Hi, Dave Falter here from the Hoodoo Gurus and you're tuned to 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community. Magnificent 7, HFM 107.3. Does your business have a good web presence? Are you missing business opportunities by having an outdated web page? Did you know there are six important tips to boost your web personality? Let station sponsor Antonovich Design build or update your web page. Your website will be custom designed to suit your needs working directly with our experienced designers. Get more leads and more conversions with a web page that is browser friendly and works on all devices. Call Antonovich Design on 0449 134 191. And Neville, getting to one of the most important things of the evening, you have a book coming out. I know this about you. Can you tell us a bit about when, where, how it's going to be launched? Well, um, I dare I say I'm going to be 30 again uh, at the end of the month. <laughs> and right. uh, the uh, book launch is basically coinciding with my 30 again birthday party. Uh, and I'm going to have about 70 people there. And this was all Zell's idea because I'd had this book cover sitting in dust for about three or four years. Um, and she said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a book launch birthday party. What a brilliant idea. Yeah, that's actually a pretty cool idea. <laughs> So that's how that Sometimes came about. my brain works well. <laughs> so August the 5th, uh, we will have it uploaded to... Uh, Which is a Thursday. Saturday. Yeah. If it's a Thursday, we got problems. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying Saturday to mess the with 5th. people. Yes, yeah. that's right. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, nevillegreenwood.com.au from the 5th of August onwards. At the moment, it just says, if you would like notification, send me an email and I'll notify you on the day. But other than that, on the 5th, it'll be properly launched and uh, we're going to be over at Dada, uh, which is the Disability in the Arts, over at Fremantle. So um, uh, we'll be uh, having a launch there, uh, you know, the odd ale or two and uh, some, some uh, food. And that will be my 30 Again book launch party. Well, congratulations, and I wish you the very best of luck for it. I'm sure it's going to be a cracker, especially if Zell's got anything to do with it. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Look, while we're talking about crackers, this is a terrible segue, um, I want to ask, if, you, if there was something that you could change, like if you could be a minister for the day or if you can be in charge of the day or something and there was one thing you could change, what would it, what would it be? Look, 
there's certain aspects of accessibility that have become aware to me, um, like just reading websites. And look, I'm a web designer, and look, most small businesses don't want to pay for the extra cost of doing accessibility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would, I would basically have the government basically have a whole lot of business templates for small business so they could actually have it done in an accessible format so that there was an extra cost applied to it that would make you know sometimes poor Zell there's buttons and things that she can't see and uh, look even the NDIS she was putting in a plan one year and there was a button there she couldn't see and uh, she couldn't even put a plan in you know so yeah <laughs> if the NDIS can't get it right <laughs> <laughs> well that's right what do you think of the NDIS me, I think the NDIS, when it works well, it works really, really well. And for me at the moment, it is working quite well, so yeah. I'm happy with it. I am aware there are issues uh, with it. But look, it did start as a pilot program. Uh, there was an option to wait till the program was perfected and then let it fly. Uh, I was one of those who advocated that it should um, just go out. Uh, as it is and we'll fix it as we go so which is probably a good idea yeah that's what's going on at the moment so you know it's a work in progress uh and as life changes which does all the time so will the ndis so there's a review coming up now i guess there'll always be reviews coming up that's it's a very big big it's uh, huge program. it's yeah. huge yeah but i've certainly seen it it allow people to live their best lives which is fantastic yeah but as you say there's uh there's some holes where people aren't and it would be nice if that could be fixed yeah Yeah. hopefully yes and and certainly there's some things with uh, uh, zelly uses something called ira ira basically allows it someone to get on her camera and see through her camera so she can on the phone so she can see those mushroom tins and walk down the street and dangerous and go because zell might be in the city and go well, geez, I don't know where. I think I'm going the wrong way. She can turn the eye on. And they can basically see the camera through her phone mm-hmm. and tell us. Unfortunately, it's out of the US. It's like what three thousand a year or so. I don't know what the price Two is. Two odd thousand. I mean, but it's it's a, yeah. Yeah, literally, you are able to contact these people any time of the day through the app and mm-hmm. get them to. So I use them to help me navigate to where I need to go. Prior to that, I used to use Google and Apple uh, Maps and uh, I'd get very, very lost. Uh, But now with Ira, uh, someone else does all the work, do the guiding (laughs) through and they can, you know, they have access to the navigation apps. They have access to my camera so they can see what I'm doing as well and they can see all the buildings around me as well so then they can check that with what they're seeing on their navigation apps and guide me pretty much correctly pretty much to the door and it it is really really good that's brilliant so that's what i mean about technology now for me making a huge difference definitely yeah i would a little bit of james brown please james shall we go now yeah Bible says 
forget Neville that we are on the Magnificent Seven and we ask all of our guests if you could invite eight guests alive or dead to come and join you at a dinner not including your family, we assume you're going to invite them already, who would you invite and okay we're not inviting the fam (laughs) who would you invite and why? First one I'm going to get Heston Blumenthal Ah finally! Because you have to have someone to cook at one of these dinners otherwise they're all going to leave early (laughs) right? You need the best cook so I'm going to meet him. Yeah. Uh, then I say Mozart because you know you're someone who can you know bump out a tune, you know keep the mood Bit of going. Entertainment, yeah, I like the practicality. yeah. You got to get the two parts of those going, and then you go after the six. So then I'm going um, Jesus. Uh, I feel like he could give us a bit of perspective on the rest of the conversation. And donate to the wine cabinet. Yes, that's it. And he likes a red. Um, Elon Musk. Because oh. the man is just a, a genius across so many areas, I don't know where to start. AI, electric cars, robots, tunnels. Batteries. Batteries. Rocket. You, like, yep. Rocket, you name it. <laughs> you name it, he's across it. So that would be great to save your fortune in, in time, you know, really reading up about it. Mm-hmm. He'd give it to you. Uh, Nicholas Tesla, because I still think I'd like to know what papers he had that was stolen mm. by the FBI never returned. I want to know what's in them. I really need to know that. I think that's the nature of secrets, isn't it? Yes, yes, I know. So, um, <laughs> uh, and Winston Churchill, uh, just yeah, because I just, for the smell of cigars. Oh, <laughs> you know, I just want to hear the verbiage. I mean, they they say that he marshaled the English language and took it to war, and he really did during World War Two. Just the most amazing orator. He has some amazing uh, put downs. There's, there's books of his put downs, uh, yes. which are really it's, quite clever. Yes, I remember. Uh, and remember not a single expletive anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do know a few of those. Leonard Cohen, because he's sort of my hero in terms of songwriting and lyrics. He just he's just such a craftsman with it. He's just amazing, um, amazing body of work. And John F. Kennedy, I really want to get to the real story why he was shot. Was it the fact that he was going to go on the Silver Standard? And there was all sorts of, you know, conspiracy. Th- theories about why he was shot and I'd like to... Maybe somebody just didn't like him. (laughs) (laughs) I'd like to really get to the bottom of you know what he thinks was the most likely you know. It's a rather male centric list there Neville. Look you are (laughs) right but you know I you know I really wanted to... uh, If you on the spot if you were to add a woman or two who would you add? Well, me, for a yes. start. He's got no um, choice You're there. the family, I think, is coming Look, anyway. I'll tell you what, I would probably love to hear Margaret Thatcher there. Oh, I yeah. thought she was amazing. Mm-hmm. A, a real battle. Um, and uh, who else? Probably Aud- uh, uh, what's Tracy Hepburn. I thought she just had a real character to her. Audrey Hepburn? No, Tracy. Mm. Okay. We could invite both of them. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. And, and can we make it nine? I really want Mary Robinson or ten or eleven. Oh. I'm from the United Nations. This is my list, all right? <laughs> I know. Hey? Get your own list. You could invite Greta and she could sit outside and protest something. No, not Greta. <laughs> no. no, anyone but Greta. <laughs> Look, 
we need to we need to wrap this up for the evening. Uh, you've been charming, Zell. Thank you very much. You've been fabulous, Neville. Thank you so much. I wish you every every success with your book launch um, and your future writing. There's going to be great. I'm going to put uh, your seventh sign track on my playlist because I really <laughs> like that one too. Um, thank you, James, for pressing buttons and being fabulous. My pleasure. I think we're going to go straight into Leonard. We've got 21 seconds before we have to stop talking. <laughs> we have indeed. <laughs> My favourite Leonard Cohen. <laughs> thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Leonard Cohen, closing time. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Good night.